Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Eileen Chen. I'm from Nova University of Lisbon in Portugal. Today I will be presenting to you a story, identification of pure painting pigment using machine learning algorithms. It's the work I did with my professor Hui and Professor Marcia from my university. And the artworks that uh, we use for our evaluation on our algorithms are the artworks by Portuguese artist Amadeu de Sousa Cardoso. He's actually very famous in Portugal and he was from the same period as Picasso. Now let's have a quick look at my outline. Sorry. Mm. Okay, so firstly, I will have a brief introduction. Then I will talk to you about breaststroke and material analysis. Finally, conclusion and future work. Firstly, introduction. Now I have a two big images here. I believe all of you can immediately guess whose work it belongs to. Van Gogh, of course, but to be very careful here. Only one of them is real, one of them is fake. Can you identify which one is real, which one is fake? Or at least can you guess? I will give you a few seconds here, okay? All right, so the one on the left is real, the one on the right is fake. So it's actually one of our objectives here because you know in actually right now in many museums, some very famous museums, even half of the works are actually fake. Now this is one of our objectives to design some machine learning algorithms to analyze artworks, especially in the areas of authentication and conservation so that we can build a set of tools to analyze artworks so that they can be used by art experts. Maybe they can be even interesting for uh, art enthusiasts or museum visitors. But we have very big problem here for machine learning problems. We always need a large amount of data because especially in the art world, it is the opposite. We have a scarcity of data due to the limited amount of the artworks produced by individual artists or individual style, or we have limited access to some artworks because they are very precious, or the acquisition of the artworks of, uh, of the data is very expensive. So what can we do now? Let's have a look at the first problem, brushstroke analysis. Okay, what does it mean? You can see here, we have two images here. I believe some of you can again guess whose work it belongs to. Van Gogh, of course. And uh, this one belongs to our uh, artist, Amadeo. So you could guess this belongs to Van Gogh. It is because of, of his particular breaststroke style. So we believe breaststroke is like our signature. So individual has very particular signature. You know, sometimes people even fake signatures. So we want to make use of those brushstroke. Maybe we can design some tools to be able to identify, uh, identify some unknown work if they are real or fake. How can we do this? Now, I have a set of data in RGB high resolution format from our Amadeus work and also his contemporaries work. Of course, this means they are from the same period. So we use half of them as the positive set, half of them as the negative set. Uh, so the Amadea work as the positive set, sorry, and the Amadea's contemporaries work as negative set. So we use half of them as the training set and half of them as the testing set. So we want to design some machine learning algorithms. So the when the testing set is evaluated, we can we can find out how many of them are correctly identified as Amadeo and how many of them are not correct, are correctly identified as non-Amadeo. So for this case, uh, uh, the classification or accuracy of using these uh, conventional machine learning algorithms is about 70%. Now we substitute these conventional machine learning algorithms with our convolutional neural network, more advanced a uh, neural network, a brain style uh, computation. The structure we applied is AlexNet. 
because I, it is very famous to identify objects. We compare different kinds of convolutional neural network. We believe this is very suitable for our objective. And as we said before, that we have very limited amount of data. So in this case, we only have about 300 images. Then we have to do a lot of data augmentation. So we did random cropping, scaling, re reflection, and the rotation. So we get more data. With the same training set, testing set, and the same objective, we use AlexNet. We get classification accuracy about 75%. Now let's continue our journey, material analysis. Uh, so it is also called pigment analysis in our research. What does it mean? So we, in addition to our RGB uh, data set, we have another set of data that is spectral data and the material data. So material data is basically the chemical data, but we mainly focus on spectral data in this paper of ours. That means we have hyperspectral images of 11 paintings and also spectral ref uh, reflectance from 17 tubes, that is 17 pigment that were said to have been used by our artist, Amadeo. Then 15 of them are color, one is black, one is white. So we want to make use of these 17 reflectance to train a machine learning algorithm. So when the a uh, hyperspectral image of the uh, painting is evaluated. We can determine in the result if a single point, a single pixel, the color of that pixel is contributed by a pure pigment or not. If it is contributed by a pure pigment, so what kind of pure pigment it is? Now that's uh, but we have said before that uh, you see we only have 17 reflectances, very limited data. So of course we have to do data of augmentation. In this case, I show the ceronium blue reflectance here. So I augment data by adding white noise so that we can get a lot of artificial samples from the true data. Now, how do we use it? I first used in our pure pigment identification for black and white. That means, you know, for one black and for one white, we augment data so that we have 30,000 samples for black and for white. And we have another group that is non-white and non-black. Well, how do we get those? You remember we have 15 colors left, right? So we, we mix three out of the 15 colors in the steps of 10% with subtractive mixing. Well, what does it mean then? This is what it means. So we randomly choose three pigments from the 15 colors, pigment one, two, three. We choose 0% from pigment one, 10% from pigment two, 90% from pigment three. We use subtractive mixing to get the first mixture. Now we do the same, use 0% pigment one, 20% pigment two, 80% pigment three. Then we get the second mixture, okay? With the subtractive mixing. Then we get about 30,000 artificial mixtures. Then people are wondering now, what is subtractive mixing then? Then I will show you quickly here. You see here, you know, RGB colors are our primary colors. It's very familiar to you, but be very careful here because we are talking about light source. We're talking about additive mixing. But for our pigment, for the uh, cartridges in our printer, for tubes, it's a different story because we are using subtractive mixing. The primary colors are same, magenta and yellow. Here I have an example when we mix white and the cerulean blue with additive mixing and the subtractive mixing. So you can see here for additive mixing, this uh, mixture are very evenly distributed, but uh, from our experience for pigment is not the case because when we mix more white, it, we have to mix a lot of white in order to make it whiter. It's the same, but when we mix uh, the blue, we mix a little bit, it will become blue very quickly because we're using subtractive mixing. So in our case, we use subtractive mixing. 
Now, we finally get these uh, uh, 30,000 samples for the mixture. So we label these three groups as 0, 1, and 0 0.5 with neural network, and this is our result. So this is wherever that is black, and here is white, and the rest would be the mixtures. Uh, okay, let's continue our journey here. Then I want to identify the pure pigment, including black and white. So for all of the 17 pigments, then I use the decision tree and support vector machine. For our training set also is for testing set because we are going to use key fault cross validation to evaluate our data for accuracy. You remember we have this pure pigment, right? 17 of them. So we have to do data augmentation again. We did this before, you remember, right? So now for each pure thing, uh, pigment, we have we augment data so that we can have 3000 samples per pure pigment. Then for the rest, I will use non-pure pigment, which means mixture. How do we get those mixtures? They are from the hyperspectral images of the painting. But how do we get this? You know that for each single point, each single pixel, there's a reflectance, right? So we compare the reflectance from the hyperspectral image of the painting with the reflectance of the pure pigment, which have the closest, we say it is pure. But if it's not pure, then it is the mixture. How do we do this? We use spectral mapping. We use spectral angle mapper and the root mean square error, SAM and RMIC. For SAM, we measure the angle between two reflectances, okay? And it has the problem with the mixtures that contains white and black. And also it is very, has a problem with the illumination. But the root RMIC, it measures point to point distance uh, between uh, re reflectances in the high dimensional space, of course. But it doesn't have the problem as Sam has. Well, I don't understand what it means. Let's see the next slide to understand it. So on the left is the result processed by Sam. And on the right is the result processed after RMIC. You can see clearly this result in comparison with our original image here is so much better. It's very smooth, right? But on the left, we have this kind of salt and pepper effect. That's exactly because it has the problem with the illumination and the mixtures that is mixed with black and white. That's why we finally opted for our MSC to in our methods. So with our what we have said before, decision tree and support vector machine, we get an accuracy of more than 90%, which is very good. So here is the result from support vector machine. So these are black and all of the ones that highlighted are the pure pigments and the other gray part are the mixtures. Okay, you remember here we have done it before a simple neural network. We identify the black and white, right? So let me show you here again. You can see some places that is not very well identified here, right? But uh, I have to clarify here because I mentioned that it is a very shallow neural network. So we have the assumption that the deeper the network, the better the result. Well, is it true? Let's continue our journey. We have this mixed pigment identification with deep neural network. That means we use the artificial mixtures along with the percentage you remember we did this make artificial mixture before, right? So we use it as the input and train a deep neural network so that one uh, hyperspectral image of a painting is evaluated. We can determine in the result for each single pixel, the color of that pixel is contributed by what kind of percentage of a pure pigment. Right, so we will get 17 uh, percentage for the 17 pure pigment. And this is our result. So on the left is the result from the five layer deep neural network. On the right is the result from the seven layer deep neural network. And as I said before, we can predict 
for each single pixel, the color of the pixel is contributed by what kind of percentage of a pure pigment, right? So those are the reconstructed image. Of course, we need a lot of reconstruction for this uh, final result. And you can see here, yellow base, right? This is very well recognized on the seven layer deep neural network, but not very well recognized on the five layer neural network. And here, brownish part is very well identified, but not on the left. That's why we have the conclusion that uh, the deeper the network, the better the result. But uh, we have to be very careful here because the neural network rely a lot on the perimeters and also the structure of the network, right? So in our case, this is our conclusion. And uh, let's take a look at this visualization. Well, well, what is it? This means regardless of a single pure pigment of its percentage, we highlight it here. So uh, wherever there's a presence of that pure pigment, we highlight it here. So uh, maybe for one pixel, it has a 10% of this color and uh, maybe another pixel has 90% of this color, we highlight it here. So for this one, we have this vermilion color. And for this one, for, we have this cerulean blue. That means, okay, remember, regardless of its percentage for that single pixel, we can do the same visualization for all of the 17 pure pigments, okay? So I think it is very uh, interesting uh, to be made as an application or software, software to be used by art experts or maybe some uh, art enthusiasts for visualization or conservation purposes. And this is our work so far, but we have more work. I cannot show it here, of course. Now, this is our conclusion. Firstly, you see before, we have done a lot of deep neural uh, network for both breast stroke and the pigment identification. And you have seen before, we always need to augment the data because we don't have enough data in the art world. And uh, you have seen before that in general, the brain style neural network always work better than the classical computation. And finally, we can have the opportunity to make some applications for visualization, con conservation or authentication, maybe even for educational purposes. Now, finally, our future work. Actually, some of them are already in the process. So we have done a lot of, used a lot of methods for to evaluate pure and mixed pigment. But we want to try other methods to evaluate them. And then secondly, we want to fuse, we want to unify both brushstroke and the pigment analysis. You remember we mentioned also we have chemical data. We want to fuse all of them together in order to authenticate paintings. When we have more data on drawing, we can apply the same method on painting for drawings. Then finally, actually it is already in the process. We want to make some interactive application or softwares to be used by many people for museum uh, visitors or for uh, conservation stuff. And uh, this is our work. This is part of the references. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Now we have, I believe, some minutes for uh, questions. Shen, I believe you have one question in the chat. Right, I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, if you prefer, you can stop sharing your screen. Sometimes it, it's easier. Right. Uh, chat. I can read it to you if you prefer. Okay, <laughs> okay. why do you listen? Right. Okay. Uh, okay, what is the question? Um, train the model with hybrid. The first question is not for me, isn't it? Uh, the first, I was referring to Serge's question. I don't, I don't know where is the other one. Uh, uh, 
why do you decide to work with the work of Armadale? Well, actually, we have a sort of a lot of Portuguese artists that I really love. But uh, for example, you know, the Portuguese artists are Armada, but uh, we have uh, I know we don't have access to it. Even for even for Portuguese artists, uh, Amadeus drawings, we have the data, but we cannot access it. You know, it's the biggest problem. We have some data available, that, but uh, due to some um, author authorization problems, we cannot access it. Even for Amadeus work, we want to also use other artists, for example, Armada but we cannot access more data. This is our intention. I hope to use as many as possible. That is the best for us. But so far, it is not quite possible. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Well, actually, uh, I have a question. Is it okay to to use the mic? Because it's yes, rather it is. strange yes, it is. To, to type. I, I was wondering. You you mentioned several uh, several future work uh, and so on. Now I'm a little bit puzzled, by the way, or why you are focusing on Portuguese authors. But that's an, another question. I'm Portuguese, by the way. That, that's okay. why I find it interesting. Uh -huh. But I, I was. Considering that you have a system that is uh, can be used for authentication purposes and so on, I was wondering to to what extent this system would be vulnerable to adversarial attacks, or that it could uh, end uh, on the same line of, of reasoning uh, that your algorithm could actually be used to indirectly to create uh, counterfeits by by guiding uh, the counterfeiting systems and first of all um we actually also used uh Van Gogh's work also chinese paintings but mm -hmm. uh, you know this length of the presentation is not enough for me to present all of them you can refer to my previous work we did on Van Gogh on chinese painting it is very interesting comparison between all of the different styles because uh, you know um, Van Gogh it is a royal painting like uh, mm -hmm. Amadeus painting we expected the result would be similar however it is not mm -hmm. it is quite interesting but for Chinese style it distinguished very well it can you can see yeah the result shows very distinguished result because for chinese paintings we have a very high percentage for the breaststroke result uh, that is very interesting for me mm -hmm. for now we have a low oh percentage. yeah exactly <laughs> that's interesting that's interesting but uh, however again as we mentioned before we have this limited data so for example we want to train the positive set and the negative set we need uh, uh, we expected to use about the equal amount of uh, positive and the negative right and you can see even in our presentation we have 200 Amadeus work, 100 Amadeus contemporaries. It is not quite equal amount. So it will certainly affect the result. But again, it's the problem with the limited data. We hope to be able to find more, but you know, we cannot, you know, we want the painting, then we have it. It's not possible because they are very precious. Mm -hmm. So that's one question I want to answer you. We have used Van Gogh and the Chinese paintings that the, the result is interesting. And secondly, I think um, the, for the final result, as uh, I have said, actually we also have chemical data, which is also very interesting, which means we use many different kinds of tech chemical analysis, for example, X-ray and some other, I don't know if you know more, but it's more, we have to fuse all of the information, breaststroke, spectral data, and the chemical data to make the whole system more robust. So now we have showed you only the spectral data result. 
So when we fuse all of the information together, it will become more robust. I hope I don't oh. know. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for your answer. Were you talking before about uh, Almada Negreiros? Was that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yes. He is also from the same period as Amadeo. Yeah. We, we have talked about it for several years to use it, but um, now we cannot, especially now pandemic is more difficult. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the pandemic because Amadeo Sosa Cardoso, he died he, he also in a pandemic of the Spanish flu, at least that's the name we give it in Portugal. He, he died uh, during that pandemic event. Yeah, yeah, I know that. He it's died very early, about 34 years yeah, ago, yeah. Spanish flu. I feel it is a shame because it is he's so excellent uh, artist i hope all of the people here can look into his work because uh, his work i i feel i could compare his work with picasso's work it's great you should look into his work okay i love him <laughs> Sorry. thank you 